record. I think the live one is much better, highly more, highly entertaining, I think. But just in case something amazing happens, I'll record this one. This lecture is both for your lecture four exam as well as your lab exam. And the idea is once I finish this, this lecture, this PowerPoint, you should be able to work some of the acid base problems in your lab notebook. That being said, um, that statement is predicated upon you all basically being finished with the, the renal PowerPoints and lectures, meaning the first one that dealt with filtration and then the second one on renal physiology that deals with reabsorption and secretion. So those, those two you should be finished with before you start really trying to tackle a lot of the problems in the lab manual that deal with acid base because there are questions in there that deal with compensation. And I will cover some of the compensation tonight with you all, but the lecture material um, for reabsorption and secretion and even the electrolyte balance lecture will help with some of these problems. Um, that all of these lectures are intertwined. There is no standalone lecture for the renal system. So first thing with this lecture, you will need to know and memorize, this will be your responsibility, this equation. <clears throat> and this is um, a pH equation unlike your standard where pH is the inverse log of the hydrogen ion concentration. This pH equation deals with buffer systems. And I did not like buffer systems when I was in chemistry. It was challenging, especially in lab titrating and, and finding pKa's. It was not my favorite part of chemistry. But I can tell you that if you were like me, we only have to deal with one buffer system, and that's the bicarbonate buffer system, which is clinically the most important buffer system that our body has. It's not the only, but clinically it's the most important. And it's the one that we focus on for uh, maintaining acid-base balance and learning how we can best help a patient through an acid-base problem. So the, the reaction that you should also commit to memory is this one. And from chemistry, you should remember that anytime we see double arrows, we know it's a reversible reaction. And so I'm going to say, I'm going to talk through this reaction going towards the left. Carbon dioxide can be hydrated, meaning it can bind to water and form carbonic acid. That's what this is. And carbonic acid can dissociate into hydrogen and bicarbonate. That's what this is. Or we can go from left to right. We can say bicarbonate will associate with a hydrogen ion to form carbonic acid, which in turn can dissociate into water and carbon dioxide. As I go through this lecture, I will explain what pKa is. I will also explain what this 0 0.03 number means to you. So just give me a moment to get through the, 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 the background story on acid base and why we care clinically. And then I'll explain the components of this equation. So if you were to calculate pH using the traditional pH equation, this is the traditional pH equation that most of you started out using when you were in chemistry. P 
pH is the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration. Another way of saying that is pH is the inverse log of hydrogen ion concentration. Um, what is the hydrogen ion concentration in our body fluids? Four times 10 to the negative eighth mole. That's mole. That's the concentration of hydrogen in our body fluids. And if I put that in the equation, I get pH is the negative log of four times 10 to the negative eight. Well, there is a property in math called the distributive property, which means I can distribute this log function. I can take the negative log of four, and then I can take the negative log of 10 to the negative eight. There are many ways to write four. There's four times one, there's two times two. There are many ways to write four. So I have written four as two times two. And again, I can distribute the negative log. So I have the negative log of two plus the negative log of two plus the negative log of 10 to the minus eight. Now this log function means to the base 10. When you take the log of something with the base 10, you're basically taking this superscript, taking it out of the superscript position and now treating it as its own digit. So the negative log of 10 to the negative eight would be negative of negative eight, which is positive eight. The negative log of two is negative 0 0.3. You do not need to memorize that. It <clears throat> is just me showing you how you can break down this equation. So if I have two negative 0 0.3s, that would be negative 0 0.6. And negative 0 0.6 plus eight would give me 7.4, which from almost week one, you have been told that our body pH is 7.40. You've heard me say it's really a range of 7.35 to 7.45, with the middle being 7.40. What would our what would it look like if our hydrogen ion concentration doubled? Well, if our normal is four times 10 to the negative eight, then a doubling would be eight times 10 to the negative eight. And if our hydrogen content doubled, then that means our pH would go down. Hydrogen ions are acidic, of course. So if I did the same math wizardry and broke down that pH equation, pH equals the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration, I would find out that a doubling of our hydrogen ion would give us a body pH of 7.1. And if we cut our hydrogen ion concentration in half, our pH would go up to about 7.7. And that is a good way to remember our, our viable limit, a, a rough way to remember the viable limit. Roughly 7.1 to 7.7 .7 represents a vi viable limit. Anything lower than that is typically um, lethal and anything higher than that is typically lethal. So up here you're seeing a survival range. And mine's just a little bit less than that, 7.1 to 7.7. .7. Uh, that, and again, that's just how I remember a viable range, roughly doubling the hydrogen content to cutting it in half. I want you to remember this viable limit that I am giving you, 7.1 to 7.7. .7. Uh, because when it comes to your lab exam and you're calculating pH, <clears throat>
after you calculate pH for a patient, and we're gonna practice this, you answer questions about what kind of acid-base disorder does your patient have and defend your answer. Um, what is one way a person can develop this acid-base problem? Is your patient compensating? If so, describe how. I would not ask you those questions. Is your patient compensating? If your patient is dead, why would I ask you questions? If your patient is dead, if they're if, whether or not they're compensating, that does not make sense. And I'm pointing this out because when students calculate pH, during an exam, they're usually nervous and they enter their data into that equation on the very first slide that I showed you incorrectly. That first equation is the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. And they, they forget what goes in the numerator and what goes in the denominator. Well, the base always goes in the numerator and the acid always goes in the denominator. And students forget, well, what was the base? what was the acid in, in that equation, they forget. And then they get crazy answers. They'll tell me the person has a pH of 25. Mm. Or a negative 5.4. So mistakes happen and I get very nonsensical pH numbers. And then the student does not even check, does not even process it mentally to go, oh, a pH of 25, a pH of negative 5.4, is that even possible? I mean, that it's, it's clearly out of viable range. And that means you have made a mistake. That is not, that is not what I'm going to give you on a test. I, it, we quadruple check these pH problems to make sure there is no mistake. Um, <laughs> so if you get something out of viable range, I assure you, you have done something wrong and you need to go back and recalculate your patient's pH. Otherwise, otherwise, if you don't, all of the other questions that come after calculating pH, you're going to get wrong. And these pH problems on your lab exam are worth 10 points each. And you're gonna have two of them. So out of, an, out of an 80 point exam, two questions from this lecture is one quarter, one quarter of your exam points. And if you calculate the incorrect pH, all those remaining points that come after it, it's poof, they disappear. So it can either be a really happy exam for you, or it's going to be a really sad one, especially when it comes to this pH question, two questions, actually. I heard someone speaking up. Did someone have a question? Okay. Hearing none. Okay, so where do these acids come from? Where do these bases come from? Well, it's, it's actually easier to start with the acids. We make acids as a byproduct of our cellular metabolism. We make, if we're in anaerobic mode, we make lactic acid. Lactic acid, the name, the name has the word acid in it for crying out loud. That's another thing during the exam. Students can't tell me that lactic acid, they don't remember lactic acid is an acid. <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand it. Um, you laugh, but it's true. So uh, some of the responses I get, it's like, yeah. Maybe we're nervous. <laughs> but the name has lactic oh, acid in it. <laughs> um, other acids that we make, well, hydrogen. Hydrogen, I mean, the concentration of hydrogen is the definition or part of the equation for pH, right? It's the concentration of hydrogen ions. Uh, carbon dioxide, strangely, is also an acid. It's a weak acid, but it is an acid. 
And then usually in the audience, I have a student who's fresh out of chemistry and says, an acid is something that dissociates at hydrogen ion and carbon dioxide does not have a hydrogen ion. And then I go, well, if we go back to this equation and we see how it's reversible, CO2 and water can form carbonic acid and in turn dissociate a hydrogen and a bicarbonate. So it is an acid. And then I can also point out that we're worried about acid rain. Uh, there are cities that have a lot of pollution and when it rains and we have a lot of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, there is global war warming, Trump. Um, and when that carbon dioxide comes down with the rain, it erodes statues. There are statues, marble, for example, they're just, the acid is eating away. You can't even distinguish a face if it's a person, uh, if it's a statue of a person. Mm -hmm. uh, our, our oceans are also becoming more acidic. Why our coral reefs are dead for the most part. We have lost significant amounts of coral reefs, especially the Great Barrier Reef. And what corals are still alive, they're losing that battle. And then the skeletons of the organisms, the actual coral shell is just eroding. It's eroding. So, um, Carbon dioxide is an acid. Uh, there are also other organic acids like arketo acids, beta hydroxybutyrate, and acetoacetic acid that you learned from unit two when you learned about metabolism. So those are just examples of the acids that we generate during metabolism. Do we make bases? Do we have bases? Yes, we do. Just give me a moment and I'll point them out in just a moment. But our, our fight mostly is to neutralize the acids we make during metabolic processes. So these acids that we make, we're making them in the cells. Okay. Well, then as they're being made in the cells, the cellular pH, the intracellular pH drops. And you all did a physio X, physio X number eight, where you learned that if the pH is not optimal, enzymatic reactions are reduced in their, in their quantity, right? We don't get as many enzymatic reactions because enzymes need to be in their optimal pH range. So if we are making these acids in the cell, then the cell pH drops and that can compromise cellular function. Okay, so inside the cell, we need a way to buffer these acids that we're making them. We need to temporarily uh, somewhat neutralize them, buffer them, so they don't cause denaturation of proteins. Thankfully, inside our cells, we have a lot of proteins. And proteins, particularly proteins that have a lot of histidine. Histidine is an amino acid that is very good at buffering acids. And it's because it has this this nitrogenous ring. Um, and that, that nitrogenous ring that I just circled is really good at uh, taking on, associating with a hydrogen. It forms what's called a Schiff's base. You don't need to write that down, but for those of you who love your chemistry, that's the amazing chemistry that histidine has. Well, so the proteins inside the cells temporarily buffer these acids that the cells are making. And then the cells, they, they get rid of these acids, like getting rid of trash. And then they put the acids out in the plasma. Well, now the plasma pH is going to drop. 
Well, thankfully in the plasma, we also have proteins. We do, we've got albumin and albumin has quite a bit of histidine residues. And even inside red blood cells, red blood cells are floating in the plasma. Red blood cells have a lot of hemoglobin. We know that from unit one and hemoglobin has a lot of histidine. So thankfully proteins are our most important intracellular and plasma buffers. They are very abundant, um, but it's still not the most clinically important buffer system. We also have buffer systems in the, the kidneys, in the tubular, tubular regions of the nephron. So if we get our acids into the plasma, we know that the kidneys filter the plasma and then all these acids are in the filtrate. And then the filtrate can become very acidic. Our urine can become very acidic. And we don't want our urine to become so acidic and not buffered in any way. It would burn when you peed. You'd never want to pee because it would hurt so much. Your urine can get so acidic. So there needs to be buffering in the lumen of the, of the nephron. And our buffers in the filtrate, in the lumen of the nephron include ammonias and phosphate groups. Ammonia is really good about buffering hydrogen and turning into ammonium. And our phosphates can bind to hydrogen ions as well. And, and if you take pathophysiology with me, you actually will learn the mechanisms for these tubular buffer systems. But for this class, for testing purposes, I just need you to know that inside the nephron, ammonia and phosphates help buffer the acids once they're in the filtrate, once they're in the lumen of the nephron. So all of these are really good buffer systems. We've got proteins inside the cell. We've got proteins in the plasma. We also have proteins, um, a hemoglobin in particular in red blood cells, which float in the plasma. We have tubular buffer systems like ammonia and phosphate. All of these are wonderful buffer systems, but the one that is the most clinically relevant to us, one that we deal with all the time in a hospital setting is the bicarbonate buffer system. This is the buffer system I showed you on the very first slide where water combines with carbo carbon dioxide and forms carbonic acid, which dissociates into hydrogen and bicarbonate. And it's a reversible reaction. So the hydrogen can reassociate with the bicarbonate, form carbonic acid, and then have that dissociate into water and CO2. So how does this play out, this bicarbonate buffer system? I'm going to show you one way that this bicarbonate can be made, okay? With, with the help of the red blood cell. So here's a tissue bed. And we see a capillary going through the tissue bed. And we can see the red blood cells in the capillary. And all of these tissues, as you can see here, tiny little writing, they're making, these cells are making CO2. It's a byproduct of cellular respiration. So the CO2 comes out of the cells and, and goes into the plasma. So here it is in the plasma. And the CO2 keeps diffusing down its concentration gradient into the red blood cell. Why is it diffusing down its concentration gradient from the plasma into the red blood cell? I'll remind you that red blood cells don't have mitochondria. And we don't start making CO2 until we're in the Krebs cycle, which happens in the mitochondrion. So that doesn't happen in the red blood cell. It's not making 
huge amounts of CO2 like other cells with mitochondria are. The CO2 diffuses out of the cells into the plasma, into the red blood cell. And there inside the red blood cell is an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase. I need you to remember your Physio X number eight. Enzymes have an optimal pH, a pH where they work the most efficiently. Carbonic anhydrase is an enzyme and it is no different than the other enzymes you studied in Physio X number eight. It has an optimal pH. Remember that? I'm going to come back to that. Just give me a moment. So carbonic anhydrase, its job is to facilitate this reaction where we're hydrating carbon dioxide, where we're uniting water to carbon dioxide. That reaction does not happen on its own with high efficiency. There's a high uh, energy threshold to get that reaction to go. That's what enzymes do they lower the activation energy required. They facilitate a reaction. They make it more likely to move forward. So carbonic anhydrase is abundant in the red blood cell and it takes CO2 and water and forms carbonic acid, which dissociates into bicarbonate and hydrogen. So bicarbonate is here, the HCO3 negative, and the hydrogen ion. What did the red blood cell just do? It took a weak acid, CO2, and generated a very strong acid. What a stupid thing to do for that red blood cell. It's making things worse, it appears. But if the red blood cell could talk to you, it would say, calm yourself down. That hydrogen, is going to go to hemoglobin, to a histidine residue in the hemoglobin and be buffered, temporarily buffered. I just finished telling you that proteins are very abundant inside cells. And for the red blood cell, it has a large amount of hemoglobin. We learned that in unit one. So the histidine residues are going to buffer the hydrogen. Well, now this leaves bicarbonate, which is a base. Now it's not buffered and the pH inside the red blood cell can go up as a consequence. What did the red blood cell just do? It's crazy. The red blood cell, if it could talk to you, would say, calm your jets down. I'm just gonna kick that bicarbonate out of my red blood cell. I'm just gonna put it out in the plasma. Well, um, excuse me, red blood cell, that bicarbonate has a negative charge. You have to main electro neutrality. So if you're kicking out a negative charge, you better bring in a negative charge. And the chloride says, fine, or, or sorry, the red blood cell says, fine, I'll bring in chloride. So here's this chloride shifting into the cell. And now the bicarbonate is out in the plasma. And you might be saying, well, now the plasma has this base, this bicarbonate, and the pH, the plasma is going to go up. No, my young Padawan learners, now it's actually brilliant, and here's why. Out in the plasma, there are other acids like lactic acid or those keto acids like beta-hydroxybutyrate. I'm just gonna abbreviate it as beta hydroxy or acetoacetic acid. All of those other acids are in the plasma and having bicarbonate around will help buffer them. So it's actually a neat thing. Here we are making an acid in cells that are metabolically active. The CO2 goes in the plasma, diffuses into the red blood cell, which does a presto change magical trick. Thank you, carbonic anhydrase. Turns the CO2 and water into carbonic acid, 
which in turn dissociates into hydrogen and bicarbonate. The hydrogen will jump on to histidine residues in hemoglobin. Thank you very much. We're buffered now. <clears throat> and the bicarbonate gets kicked out to the plasma where it can help buffer other acids that we've made. And then chloride shifts in to help maintain this swapping of negative charges. It's gonna take a while for you all to be able to talk through that, but you're gonna to need to talk through that. And then that red blood cell, let's remember, is going to go with the blood back to the heart, to the pulmonary circuit, participate in gas exchange. And when it participates in gas exchange, look at this. The chloride is going to come out of the cell the bicarbonate is going to go back into the red blood cell. When the bicarbonate goes back into the red blood cell, hydrogen comes off the hemoglobin, shown here. And it's going to recreate carbonic acid, H2CO3, dissociate into CO2 and water, and CO2 is going to diffuse out of the red blood cell, back into the plasma, down its concentration gradient, why down the gradient, Kara? You, on the previous slide, you just said CO2 diffuses into the red blood cell down its gradient. Yeah, that's when the red blood cell was in a tissue bed. Now this red blood cell is in a pulmonary capillary bed. And on the other side of the capillary bed is an alveolus. And we're breathing, we're breathing out CO2. So now the CO2 levels are very low in the alveolus. And that's the reason why CO2 comes out of the red blood cell into the plasma, across the respiratory membrane into the alveolus, and then we blow it away. So our lungs, <laughs> Thank you. Our lungs are eliminating an acid that our cells make in our, in our tissue beds as a byproduct of cellular metabolism. The problem is we need a way to buffer the CO2 from where it's made, transport it into the blood and red blood cell, convert it chemically into bicarbonate, and then once that red blood cell is in the pulmonary capillary bed, reverse it so we can exhale the CO2. Well, that's great. <laughs> Lungs are eliminating. We exhale, we get out carbon dioxide, which is volatile. Great. But what about all of the non-volatile acids I told you about, like lactic acid and beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetic acid and hydrogen itself? Well, then that's where we need the kidneys. So let me ask you this. What are all of the ways out of your body? How can you get something out of your body? Your name? Yeah. You're what? Okay. <laughs> okay. Urine, vomit. Poop. Pooing. Vomit. Okay. Defecating. Um, breathing, sneezing. Breathing, um, sneezing. Okay. Um, sweat. Sweat. Tears. 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 Mucus. Saliva. Mucus? I don't. Yeah, uh, that comes out with our saliva, I guess. Yes. Um, our nose. Blood. Earwax. I'm Ear trying to think of anything else. Any other fluids bleeding out? But I don't know. I, <laughs> well, that's not that's not normal. That's um, not a good way. <laughs> if your breast, if your breastfeeding, breast that'd feeding. be another way out. Yeah. And then usually okay. right about now, there is a male in oh. the audience that goes. <laughs> Ejaculation. Okay. <laughs> Female too. I mean, sure. you know. Oh. Sure. Absolutely. <laughs> so then I do that. Then here's my follow up question. Of all those ways out of your body, 
which of them do you do the most of? Teen. Okay, you're in production, true. Breathing. Breathing. Oh, oh duh, yeah. Yep, so those are the two, out of all of those ways, those are the two we do the most oh. of through a 24 hour period. And then usually right about now I have some smart ass yeah. man in the class going, well, <laughs> let me tell you, <laughs> which makes all the females in the class roll their eyes. Yeah. Um, anyway, in a typical 24 hour period, you generate a lot of urine and you breathe a lot. Your respiratory rate is about 15 breaths per minute and you are moving, you are inhaling, exhaling 500 milliliters with every breath. So that's roughly, that's the size of your typical water bottle, you know, your plastic water bottle with every breath. So you are definitely producing an exhale of CO2 and you're getting rid of your non-volatile acids in your urine. Those are the two main ways out. So we make these acids inside the cell. Then we have to safely transport the acids in the blood and then get it out of the blood, either in your air, if it's volatile, CO2, or we have to remove it from the blood by filtering it. And then it's in the nephron. And we need to buffer those acids while they're moving in the filtrate to your bladder and out of your urethra until they're finally in the toilet. So we're going to talk about compensation. We're going to talk about how the lungs and how the kidneys can compensate. And the lungs, by the way, are not muscular structures. And they don't, they don't, they don't, our lungs don't change shape and ventilate on their own. That comes from the brain, breathing centers in the brain, medulla oblongata. So we're not going to say the lungs increase rate and depth of breathing because the lungs don't do that. We're going to say things like the medulla oblongata causes an increased rate and depth of ventilation, right? The lungs don't have that power, your brain does. So we're gonna say the respiratory system alters. And that way, if you say respiratory system, it includes medulla oblongata and your lungs and your air passageways. But don't, don't just say lungs do this because they are not able to change ventilation rate and depth on their own. That's like saying a balloon can inflate itself on its own. A balloon cannot do that. So we're gonna talk about how breathing rate and depth can change for compensation. And we're also going to talk about the different kinds of urine you can make. Bet you didn't realize you make different kinds of urine, but you do. The kind of urine you make first thing, your first void in the morning is very different than the urine you're making throughout the day when you're awake. Um, your urine composition, what we find in your urine changes throughout the day. And it reflects your kidneys, your nephrons, changing that reabsorption and secretion. What is put in the filtrate? What is reclaimed from the filtrate? So we're gonna talk about that. How can ventilation rate and depth be changed and when? And what kind of urine do you make? We're gonna focus on, are you making an acidic urine or a basic urine? Now, I would be a horrible teacher in the eyes of the chemistry department if I didn't talk about Le Chatelier's principle during this lecture or the isohydric principle. Um, because they do. The chemists talk about these principles when they're telling you about buffer systems and acid-base balance. And it has scary language, right? A lot of chemistry. Did you notice that? Chemistry has a lot of scary language. So does physics for that matter, if we think about our vector analysis. And if we're calm, we can take, 
we can take almost anything in those scary sciences like chemistry and physics. And in biology, I think of biology as that, that feel good chocolate chip cookie where just biology just is, it's just softer. It, there isn't as much scary language in biology. So let me tell you Le Chatelier's principle an isohydric principle. Let me tell you what it is. Le Chatelier's principle basically says that if you are dealing with a system like this reaction up here, if you are dealing with a system that is at equilibrium and you disrupt that system, meaning let's say you add more reactants, well, now it is no longer at equilibrium and the system will correct itself to form more products, right? If you add more, it, was, it goes back to you balancing your chemistry reactions. You had to count, you know, you had to count how many moles, the number in front of the molecule, and then you had to pay attention to the subscript like C6, H12, O6, so you had to count all of your carbons, you had to count all of your hydrogens, you had to count all of your oxygens, and you had to balance everything, didn't you? And if you, if you added something on one side, you had, to, you had to rebalance everything on the other side. If you add more reactants, you got more products. If you take away products, then you had to take away some of the reactants or the reactants would feed into the products to fill the void, right? You had to rebalance everything. That's Le Chatelier's principle with buffers. If you're dealing with a buffer system at equilibrium, if you disturb it, let's say you add more CO2, okay? If I add more CO2, then the reaction is going to shift this way or more hydrogen and bicarbonate. Well, that's a left shift. What's another way I can make a left shift? Another way is if I make the bicarbonate go down. If I make the bicarbonate go down, then the equation is going to shift to the left to fill the void. How can I do a right shift? I, I have two options again. I can make the equation go to the right more. If I add more bicarbonate, and then I'm going to shift everything to the right to form more CO2. Another way to make everything shift to the right is if I lower CO2, then everything shifts to the right to fill that void. That's Le Chatelier's principle. It's trying to find a new equilibrium. It's trying to write, write the, the tipping boat, right? The boat's taking on water and we're trying, we're trying to correct it. And so here, let me put the biology spin on it. You've, you've known this since week one. It's a chemist's way of describing homeostasis, my sweets. That's all it is. If we have a variable that deviates, then we're going to see correction. That's all Le Chatelier's principle in this isohydric is just another way of stating Le Chatelier's principle. That's, all, that's it. If you disrupt a variable and it deviates out of your set point range, you're going to see correction. That's all you need to know. And the question is, which way is this going to shift our reaction? Are we going to shift so that we make more bicarbonate and hydrogen? Or are we going to shift so that we generate more CO2 and water? That's all. And, and look, when we were in a tissue bed, when we were in a tissue bed where the cells made the CO2, everything shifted to the left. Right, We made hydrogen and bicarbonate in the red blood cell. That's when we were in the tissue bed. But when that red blood cell got to the pulmonary capillary bed, then we shifted everything to the right so we could exhale the CO2 into the lungs. 
or I should say it diffused into the alveoli and then we exhaled it. So in a tissue bed where the acid is being made, we shift to the left and we make more hydrogen and bicarbonate. When that red blood cell suspended in that plasma gets to the pulmonary capillary bed, the bicarbonate comes back into the red blood cell. We recreate carbonic acid and in turn it dissociates into water and CO2 and the CO2 diffuses out of the red blood cell into the alveolus and we blow it away. It's a reversible reaction happening in our, in our tissue beds and pulmonary capillary beds. It's wonderful. So in order for us as biology, physiology students to appreciate Le Chatelier's principle as really homeostasis, then we need to know what our variables are. Our variables that we monitor, okay, again, this is what we monitor in a clinical setting. What we monitor is the bicarbonate and the CO2. Those are our variables. They have set points. They have set points. They have normal ranges and you need to know them. So the normal range of bicarbonate is going to be 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury. And bicarbonate, we're, we're going to see a range where we're going to have um, milli equivalents. Okay, so they have different units. Just give me a moment there. I got it. I got to explain that. Okay. So our, our variables, like I said, are bicarbonate and CO2. Those are the two things we monitor in a clinical setting. Now here's something else you need to know. Bicarbonate is the base. And CO2 is the acid. Okay. Sarah, Sarah, yeah. Quick question. I don't know why this just popped in my head right this second. I know we always talk about pages and pages and pages of lab work that we can get from a blood draw. Our pH, I don't know why I don't know this. Like right now, if I had a blood draw, can we tell if my pH is 7.4 from a blood draw? Or is that like yes. a stick test? No, we, we why, can. Why don't we, I know that? <laughs> yes, we, they give you the, the body pH. So okay. again, again, um, me asking you to calculate pH is something you will never have to do in a clinical right. setting. Someone else is going to do that for you. It's still nice to know how, I mean, I understand, but okay. But I need you to know how, which equation they're using. Right, and why it's important and all the wonderful stuff. And why, and then you as the nurse or PA, whatever you all are going to become, right. your job, and this is what you're going to be tested on, is to evaluate that pH. Mm -hmm. So here we go. Here's, gotcha. here's, here, we're, we're learning the ABCs of ABGs. Okay. We're learning ABCs of ABGs. All right. So we're learning the one, two, three steps, ABCs of arterial blood gases. That's what ABG stands for. Okay. Okay. So what you as a nurse will get back those pages and pages of data, true, you're okay. going to see the pH. Okay. But what you won't have is a diagnosis from the lab. Mm -hmm. That is your job. Mm -hmm. So you need to be able to look at that blood pH <clears throat> and here's step one, here's step A, okay? Your first job is to look at that pH. And for testing purposes, we are going to hold to a hard 7.40. Do you see that I have two digits after the decimal point? Yes. When you calculate pH for me, I want two digits. Okay. 
I want two digits after the decimal point. And don't give me a rational crap of oh, significant figures. I want two digits after the decimal point. <clears throat> There's a reason, okay? There's a reason. Now, can you all see my hands in the camera? Yes. Okay. Let this hand represent acid. Mm -hmm. Let this hand represent base, okay? Mm -hmm. Our pH in our body is not a perfect 7.0. Mm -mm. It's not, but that's neutral. Mm -hmm. We're pretty close, but we're not exact. 7.40 is slightly basic, slightly alkaline, okay? True. Mm -hmm. But overall, <clears throat> we're hearing that acids and bases need to neutralize each other, right? That's what they do. That's what they do. Now, how can, what is acidosis? Acidosis is when a person's pH is going to be below that normal range of 7.35. Okay, so normal range is 7.35 to 7.45. <clears throat> and alkalosis would be when someone's pH is higher than 7.45. Costco. Oh, I'm really driving with Julia. Okay. But for our testing purposes, we're going to hold a 7.40, okay? Hard, hard line. And this is so no one second guesses the process. So I need you to know the truth. There is a normal range, but for testing purpose, we're holding a hard 7.40. So, so are you saying if I got a calculation on my lab test at 7.35, I will say my patient is acid, in acidosis? I'll, I'll one up you. Okay. If you calculate 7.39. I'm in acidosis. Okay. And if I'm in 7.41, I'm in alkalosis. Okay. Okay. That's the reason why I want two digits. But not in real seven. life. Yeah. Okay. That is how hard of a line I want to draw for testing okay. purposes. Okay. And you'll appreciate this once we start doing our, our problems. Calculations. Okay. Okay. So how can, what does it mean if someone has acidosis, their pH is below 7.40 for testing purposes, for testing purposes. Okay. What is it if they have alkalosis? It is higher than 7.40. Okay. Again, for testing purposes, that's how hard of a line. And all of the tutors, all of the tutors obey this. Okay. It doesn't matter if you have friends in Shaw's or Perez's class, they follow the same tight line. Okay. Okay. So how can a person, remember, which one was this? Which acid okay and this one was base right yeah how can a person have acidosis well usually a student goes Kara, too much acid of course so then it would look like this we're not neutralizing anymore we've deviated that is one way to have acidosis too much acid but there's a second way mm -hmm. You can have too little base. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. How can a person have alkalosis? Easy way, too much base. Mm -hmm. Or too little acid. Too little acid. Do you see either way, they are no longer neutralizing? Kind of, kind of like the pair and the sympathetic, two ways to turn on the tone of it. Correct. Kind, kind of. Yeah, I like the analogy, it works. Okay, so now you need to remember what is your base? Your base is bicarbonate. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> your acid is CO2. And 
those were part of the Henderson Hasselbach I gave you. Here is your base. It always goes in the numerator. Here is your acid. It always goes in the denominator. Now I started to tell you that these values, <coughs> um, so base, what is the normal value for base? Normal value, <coughs> excuse me, is 22 to 26 milli equivalents. Millimolar, okay? Milli equivalent, millimolar. You can interchange them for bicarbonate. Um, but I, you will likely see milli equivalent in your lab manual, but also it's millimolar. Okay. For CO2, it is 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury. Okay. pH is one of those rare calculations where there are no units. That's why I like it. It's a naked number. <laughs> now, in order, it, in order for it to be a naked number, we have to get rid of the units, my sweets. Because when you put in base, if you say this is 24 millimolar, and this is 40 millimeters of mercury, <clears throat> Please understand, it's just not the numbers you're dividing. You got to get rid of the units. And millimoles, those are, that's a concentration. Millimeters of mercury is a pressure. These are not synonyms. These are not equal <clears throat> units. You, so how do you get rid of them? because you have to get rid of them. We're calculating pH. That's where this 0 0.03 comes in. 0 0.03 is a conversion unit. <clears throat> it's a conversion unit. It converts the millimeters of mercury into millimolar. And now our units divide out, they cancel each other. So, so that's literally the reason why it's in this thing so that we can get rid of these units. That's nice, I like that. <laughs> it's nice and neat. Yeah, I, that's <clears throat> I like it. Now this PKA, Good. a PKA <clears throat> is a dissociation constant. It, another way of saying it is how likely how likely is this hydrogen going to come off, dissociate and form hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions? That's what it's saying. How likely is it to come off versus go back on? Okay. Okay. These things have been measured. And for our body temperature, for our physiology, <clears throat> the pKa is 6.1. So you, you need to memorize that. It does not change. Now in chemistry, in chemistry, pKa is changed based on temperature and other factors. Uh, but for us, mm, no. no, we're homeotherms. So <clears throat> the pKa for this system is 6.1. I'll take okay. it. Yeah, so right. 6.1. Now here are common mistakes. When students use this equation, here are the common mistakes. And this is the reason why they get a pH of like 25 or a pH of negative 33. I mean, I've seen, I've seen the most bizarre answers. <clears throat> Here's, here they are, you ready? One. They forget what goes in the numerator versus denominator. Number two, they forget it is 0 0.03. They write in things like 0 0.3 or just three. So they forget that conversion factor. <clears throat> 
I admit it's a weird number, 0 0.03, but it's a conversion unit. If I say, what is a dozen? You say, well, if I say half dozen, you say, six. If I say baker's dozen, you say, 13. Okay, there we go. So <clears throat> 0 0.03 is a conversion unit. So numerator versus denominator, <clears throat> conversion unit, order of operations. Order of operations. Do you know what that means or have we forgotten our fifth grade math? I mean, sometimes, but. Okay. <laughs> no, I can remember to do it though. <laughs> so when I was a freshman in high school, I went to an all girl private Catholic high school in Anaheim. And uh, Sister Mary Beth Muir, Sister Mary Beth, Sister Mary Beth Muir made us sing our order of operations every day. So every, every day when we started math, we had to say a decade of the rosary. <laughs> um, I don't know why that was uh, a requisite before doing math, but it was. So after we said our, our decade of the, of the rosary, <clears throat> we then sang our order of operations. She would make us stand up and sing it every day. So <clears throat> here we go. You ready? Uh -huh. <sighs> PEMDAS. PEMDAS. PEMDAS, <clears throat> except we didn't learn it as PEMDAS at Cornelia Connolly School of the Holy Child Jesus. We, we learned it as a song and it went like this. Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally is a... <laughs> I thought my honey was gonna come in. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally is a song that we all use. P is for parentheses, E for exponents too. <laughs> Multiplication and division, addition and subtraction. If we follow all the rules, it will get us out of school. Ooh, 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 please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. So that was the song that we had to sing. Oh my Francis, you call that I love it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> my cheeks hurt. Uh, I feel like we're in um what's the song with what's her face or the movie? The sound of music. Thank you. Gosh, I couldn't even do it. I, yes, that's where I thought we were. Needle pulling thread. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that was my husband just came in and went, Oh, my Francis, you call that teaching? And I was like, Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's called self deprecating humor to make the students laugh. I'm teaching math for crying out loud. Um, <laughs> so if you want to help yourself, you can put brackets, think of them as parentheses here. To handle that stuff. <clears throat> All right. So you have to do your multiplication and division within that bracket first because the brackets are parentheses. Okay. <clears throat> so then students say, well, do I, do I do the multiplication in the denominator first or can I just... Whatever you you can take that numerator number and divide it by 0 0.03. And then the answer you get, you divide it by the partial pressure CO2. You can do it. It just has to be in the parentheses. You do that first. What you just said it, what, that P partial pressure for carbon. What? Yeah. What is that P there for? That's throwing me off a little bit. That P stands for partial pressure. But uh, do not do not worry about what partial pressure well okay i'll tell you 
I mean, still utilize the number that's there though. You're not like doing weird things with there's, it. So. There, you don't do anything with the P. Okay. <clears throat> so what I gave you over here, this normal range is the partial pressure of CO2. It goes, it goes into Dalton's law, which in oh. unit four, you have to know, but not until you get to the respiratory system. It basically states, okay. <clears throat> if you have a gas mixture, which is what you're breathing. Okay. There is mostly nitrogen in this air, about 79%. Then you've got oxygen, which is about mm, 20%. And then you've got CO2. And Dalton's law states that if you know the total pressure, the total pressure of the air around you living at sea level is 760 millimeters of mercury. Well, <clears throat> then you need to know the partial pressure of a particular gas. So for example, nitrogen I just said is 79%. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if you take 79% of 760, then you will know the partial pressure from that total that nitrogen contributes. Okay. Okay. And that's what that P stands for. Of that's what the P stands for. So out of all of this pressure, what portion, so think of P as what portion is it for CO2? Okay. Okay. So even in your body, you have a mixture of gases in yes. your body. You have nitrogen in your body. You have, you have nitrogen gas, you have oxygen gas, you have CO2 gas. Right. <clears throat> so you need to know what portion of the total comes from a particular gas. So they're doing it to be precise, but it is not affecting the way we do this math equation because right. there's right. Perfect. Okay. Makes sense. So we do not use partial pressure of oxygen, for example, in this equation. Oxygen is not an acid. <laughs> we don't use nitrogen, right? It's the partial pressure of CO2. Okay. And um, so you asked, do we draw blood and figure out someone's pH? Yep. Can we draw blood? And the lab tells us the bicarbonate concentration of our patient. Absolutely. Yes. <clears throat> can we draw, we need to draw a different kind of blood. We need to draw arterial blood to find out the arterial pressure of CO2. Mm. Okay. <clears throat> now doing an arterial blood draw, my friends, is a different beast. You don't get it from the anticubital fossa they usually go for it from the radial artery mm. and arteries are a lot deeper than veins. So this is a lot more invasive arteries. Um, you're probably also going through quite a bit of connective tissue and you're going through tunica media. That's thicker. It, it's more painful. It, it is, it is not, and it is just not as easy as a venous blood draw. <clears throat> but we, we do arterial blood gases all the time. Remember I said the ABCs of ABGs. So we do this all the time, send it to the lab and we can find out how much CO2 is in the arterial blood. And the normal value should be between 35 and 45 millimeters of mercury. Okay, okay. So let me just take the middle for the bicarbonate between 22 and 26. The middle is 24 millimolar. <clears throat> and between 35 and 45 millimeters of mercury is 40. So let me just multiply my 40 by my conversion unit and I get 1.2. And I divide my 1.2 into 24 and I get 20. <clears throat> and then I take the log of that. So I take the log of what I found in my parentheses. And the log of 20 is 1.3. And then I add it to my 6.1. Remember <clears throat> our order of operation. And I get 7.40. Okay. Yeah. 
now, those of you who have scientific calculators and, and you're gonna wanna have a scientific calculator, um, you need to learn how to use that function, that log function. And some of you have scientific calculators where they want you to hit log first and then start parentheses, just like I gave you brackets in this slide. And some of you have calculators where they want you to do the parentheses, like write everything out in the parentheses and then hit log. So you're, you're going, to, if, you, if you do it out of order, um, based on what your calculator wants versus doesn't want, if you do it out of order for your calculator, it'll give you error. <clears throat> so if you get an error when you first try, try and reverse how you enter it into your calculator. Your calculators are computers and they like things entered in a certain way. So I suggest you practice with these numbers to make sure you know how to enter the information into your calculator to get this answer of 7.40. <clears throat> now, let me ask you a question. Look very carefully at this equation that I have up here. <clears throat> let me just erase everything. so we can clean it up. <clears throat> Does PKA change? No. Good. Does 0 0.03 change? No. Does the log to the base 10 change? No. What changes in our patient? What do we send to the lab and wait for? What are they telling us back? The base values and the acid values. Correct. Like partial acid values. They are telling us the millimoles of bicarbonate and they are telling us the CO2 values in our patient. Okay. That is the part that changes. That's, That's the part that we're worried about. That's the part that we focus on in a clinical setting. And look, <clears throat> no nurse, I have not seen a nurse yet walking around doing his or her shift with a science calculator, a scientific calculator in their pocket. I've never seen it, doesn't happen. So there must be a way, there must be a way where a nurse and a doctor <clears throat> can look at the pH that the lab sent back saying, here's the pH of your patient, here are the bicarbonate levels of your patient, and here are the acid levels of your patient, your CO2 levels. There must be a way where they look at those three things and they go, right then, I know what's wrong with you. And that's what I'm going to teach you. Okay, so first, what is acidosis? Too much acid. What is <clears throat> acidosis? It's anything, it's a pH below 7.40. That's acidosis. Mm -hmm. How can my patient get acidosis? There are two ways. Too much acid or too little, too little base. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> too much acid, that makes sense. Yeah. But also, if I have too little of this base to neutralize, what is, al what is alkalosis? A so pH greater than, higher than 7.40. Right. How can my patient get there? Too much base. Right. Or too or little. Too much. Right. Okay. Now, so that's the first thing. Number one, look at the pH. Is it higher 
than 7.40? If so, you say? Alkalosis. Good. Is it lower than 7.40? Then you say? Acidosis. Good. So that's step one, part A. Part B, how can my patient get there? If it's acidosis, too much acid, that would mean a CO2 higher than 45. Okay. Or too little base. That would be a bicarbonate less than 22. Okay. Mm -hmm. If my patient's pH is higher than 7.40, okay. that's alkalosis. How can my patient get there? Too much base, which would be a bicarbonate level greater than 26. Right. Or too little acid, which would be a CO2 level less than 30. 35. Right. Okay, so it's time for our break. I'll see you at 8.30. <clears throat> Come back with your homework packet and your lab manual. Okay. Because the very next slide shows you what you can expect on your lecture exam. <clears throat> Remember lecture exams, no calculators are ever needed. Never, never. So how am I going to test you on a lecture exam on acid-base balance when this is an equation? On the very next slide, I'm going to show you how we can just look at a certain part of this equation and evaluate it without using numbers. <laughs> we can, okay? So come back with your homework packet and your lab manual. I'll see you at 8.30. Okay.
Um, so can you all see my PowerPoint again now? Yes. yes. Okay. The very next slide that I was referring to looks like this. And up at the top of this, this slide, you're seeing options A through D. And these are the same options you are seeing in your homework packet. And the title of the slide is that we've modified the H and H equation. It stands for the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. Not to be confused with David Hasselhoff, it's the Henderson-Hasselbalch. Um, so <clears throat> the things that can change in that equation versus things that stay constant. We agreed before the break that our bicarbonate levels can change in our patient. The partial pressure for CO2 can change in the patient. And therefore the pH can change in the patient. And I said to you, there are three things that a nurse and a doctor are able to look at. And that's pH, CO2, and bicarbonate, and they're able to figure out what is wrong with their patient. All right, so now we're going to do that as well. <clears throat> you need to remember your first step. You need to evaluate the pH. That is step number one, or step A. If your patient's pH is low, it's acidosis. If it's high, it's alkalosis. Notice in the homework packet and on this slide, I don't even give you pH numbers. I give you an arrow. And the arrow is either up for high pH or down for low pH. If it's low pH, it's acidosis. If it's high pH, it's alkalosis. So that's step one. Then notice your numerator and denominator. If you see an arrow going up, it means that value is high. If you see an arrow going down, it means that value is low. That makes sense. But you need to know your normals. You need to know these ranges because then that allows you to figure out exactly what is wrong with your patient. If your patient has, if your patient, how do I wanna say this? Give me a moment. Let's, let's look at letter A. Let's start with that. Look at letter A. <clears throat> The pH is high. Do you agree? Yes. Okay, so the patient has alkalosis. And look at letter B. The pH is low. What is that? Acidosis. Good. And letter C, the pH is also low. What is that? Acidosis. Acidosis. Good. And letter D, the pH is high. Oh. Good, okay. <clears throat> Kara, it seems kind of funny that we have two alkalosis and two acidosis answer choices. What's going on with that? Okay, let's go back to letter A. <clears throat> the patient has alkalosis. How can the patient have alkalosis? What are the two ways? So we can have alkalosis from too much base or too little acid. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. You look at your patient's chart and you see that their base 
and their acid are, are both above normal range. Both are out of normal range. Both are high. But one of those things caused the acid base problem. And the other is actually showing you Le Chatelier's principle. It's showing you correction. It's showing you compensation. It's showing you that the equation is trying to shift. That, that the body is trying to fix itself? Yes. Okay. So then the issue is with the base being too high? Correct. And let me, so let me say it again, because Sarah took a leap and other people at 838 at night are going, I, I, how did Sarah get that? Okay, my sweets. You all said for patient A, let's call letter A patient A. Patient A has alkalosis. Okay. How can we have alkalosis? Too much base. And little acid. Or too little acid. But then we look at our patient's values and the lab chart shows both are too much. You can't, you can't, you can't have alkalosis from too much acid. Can you? Mm -mm. That's not one of the choices. But look, look at letter A, patient A, they have too much acid. That's the body trying to compensate. So then that's the compensation. Okay. But can the person have alkalosis from too much base? Yes. That's why the P is by there for problem. And the C stands for compensation. Oh. But look, 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 look. If you really know your stuff, you don't I, need that there. I should be able to cross that stuff out. And you should be able to figure out which one is the problem and which one's the compensation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when, <clears throat> when the base is the problem, when the base is the problem, we say the patient for letter A has metabolic. When the base is the problem, it's a metabolic issue. They've eaten something. They've had something to drink. They have an issue with metabolism in their body. If the base is the problem, it's a metabolic issue. Eat, drink, enzymatic reactions. If the acid, which is CO2, is the problem, it's a breathing problem. It's a respiratory problem. So look at patient B. They have a low pH. You all said that's acidosis. How can my patient have that? Too much acid or too little base. <clears throat> I look at my patient values and they are both too low. Only one of, only one of those fits the diagnosis. Only one of those can cause acidosis. I can't have acidosis from too little acid. No, it's too much acid. So the too little acid for patient B is not the problem. No. But I can have acidosis from too little base, can't I? Correct. So that's the problem. So th that means patient B has metabolic acidosis because base is the problem yep and the too little co2 is reflecting the shifting 
Shifting in the equation that I told you about. <clears throat> if we have reactants going low, then the products need to go low. If we have reactants going high, then the products go high. What about patient C? Two. You said they have acidosis. Too high of, they have too high of acid. Correct. So when acid is the problem, it's, it's a respiratory. So patient C has respiratory acidosis. And their too high of base is compensation. Correct. Now, it's going to take time for me to tell you the compensation and how that happens, okay? We're just learning how to evaluate without using a calculator. It's all we're doing. It's all we're doing right now. What about patient D? Mm, well. High pH, always start with the pH. Talk yourself through it. My patient has high pH. That means alkalosis. How can my patient get there? Too much base or too little acid? Patient chart shows both are too little. I can't have alkalosis from too little base. That doesn't make sense, but I can have alkalosis from too little acid. And when acid is the problem, it's a respiratory issue. Yeah. Okay. Look at the pH. Talk through it. pH is high. My patient has alkalosis. How can my patient get into that trouble? Too much base, too little acid. Let me look at my patient's chart. Huh, both are too high. Only one can be the problem, the instigator of this issue. The other reflects the patient's body trying to get out of trouble. Shall we do it again? No calculators, you want more? <laughs> yes, we do. 20, 20 points. Yeah. Okay, that's a lot. It's a fourth of your exam. Yeah, especially since that exam's one week after the lecture exam. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Get on. I have only met in my 15 years as a full-time instructor, I have only met two students that hated acid-base balance. Everyone else, once we practice, everyone else out of 15 years would say, can you make, can you make the whole lab exam acid-base? This is actually fun. I feel like I'm a detective. Yeah, and it's, that's what you are. It just takes some practice and you've got to talk it out. So here is your handy dandy little talking sheet. It has everything you need. If my patient's pH is below 7.40, <laughs> acidosis. If it's higher than 7.40, it's alkalosis. How can I have acidosis? Too much acid or too little base? If I determine that the base is the problem, it's a metabolic issue. If I determine the CO2 is the problem, it's a respiratory issue. And that means you have to know your, no your norms. So bicarbonate, remember, is 22 to 26 millimolar. And by, uh, CO2 is 35, 45 millimeters of mercury, right? You have to know those normal ranges because when your patient's chart comes back, they're going to give you numbers. That's what they're going to give you. It'll be your job to look at pH, look at bicarbonate, look at CO2. Based on the pH, you go, hmm, it's too high. Alkalosis. How can my patient get there? Too much base, too little acid. 
one of those things is the problem. One of those things is the compensation. And my sweets, if you know the problem, then you go after the problem. That's what you go after. That's how we treat the person. So here's more practice. Here, this is all you need from the patient's chart. They will give you numbers, of course. Of course, they're going to give you actual numbers. But I'm taking numbers out of this practice. Let's just think in general terms. pH is low. What does that mean? Acidosis. Good. How can my patient get there? Acid. Too much acid. Too much acid. Too or... And now, and now I look at my patient values and everything is too much. Only one fits. Too much acid. There we go. And if acid is the problem, it's a respiratory issue. Earlier, you all said the two fastest ways out of the body is breathing and peeing. Okay. Our respiratory system helps with compensation when it can. Mm. Our renal system helps with compensation when it can. If a patient has a respiratory disorder, do you think the lung, do you think the lungs can compensate if the respiratory system is dysfunctional? If it's not acting well? If if the respiratory system is dysfunctional, how do you expect it to compensate? It's the problem for crying out loud. Probably not well. So the person has a breathing issue. That if you have a breathing issue, then the breathing cannot compensate. The breathing is what's causing the problem. Yeah. All you have left is to pee. You know. oh. And look, if someone, look, 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 look. If someone has a respiratory disorder and all you have left is the renal system to compensate, given enough time, the kidneys will fail. Oh. And if the kidneys fail, guess what else goes? They're gonna die. There, well, there goes your hematocrit, remember? Mm. Oh, because of your oxygen, your EPO and stuff. Oh, shit. Uh -huh which is gonna make the whole oxygen carrying issue. Well, you're all just, it's a vicious cycle. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh God. Yeah. So this is a respiratory disorder. <sighs> and, and down here, and you're gonna learn what all of this means, but down here, this is all renal. This is all renal compensation and we'll get there, okay? We'll get there. Don't sweat it yet. We'll come back to these slides. Right now we're just, we're doing part A and we're doing part B. Step one, step two, look at the pH. Is it acidosis or alkalosis? That's step one. Step two, which problem is it? And how do you know? That's where you have to know your normal values. And that's where you look at your patient values. Bicarbonate is too high, CO2 is too high. My patient has low pH, high bicarbonate does not cause a low pH. Here's another one. Alkalosis, yeah, alkalosis. By the way, when you're ready to come back, this slide 13, 14, 15, and 16 are transcribed. And I actually talk through all of this and I tell you about the compensation, okay? So I've written it all out, but we're doing it now live. The transcript is like a safety net. So this patient has alkalosis. Huh. How can my patient get there? Too much base, too little acid. I look at my patient chart and the base and the acid are too low. Only one can cause that problem of alkalosis. That's too little, too little acid. Which is a respiratory problem. 
So they have respiratory alkalosis. And if the respiratory system is dysfunctional, what is the only system left to compensate? The renal. Renal. Renal compensation. Uh -oh. How that happens, the molecular process, we're going to get there. We'll get there. Not right now. Here's another one. Acidosis. Mm -hmm. How can my patient get there? Too much acid, too yeah. little base. It's the base, so it's a metabolic issue, right? Good. So it's metabolic acidosis. So now he can at least does she or she can breathe maybe it out. Or... So when it's a metabolic problem, both the respiratory and renal system can compensate. So better fighting chance. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Phew. That's assuming the patient doesn't have a renal lot of other failure. <laughs> renal failure. Right. So for testing purposes, we are not entertaining renal failure. You're not allowed to say, nope, my patient isn't compensating because they're in renal failure. Not allowed. <clears throat> not allowed. That's advanced acid base issues. Uh, I shouldn't say issues. That's advanced acid base learning. That's pathophys. In pathophys, I take acid base balance to the next level, which is advanced. This, what we're doing, 90% of your acid base problems in your patient, I'm covering. That's what we're doing right now. 90% of the time, we're solid. It gets messy when a patient has renal failure and then they're all over the place, all over the place. So don't worry about that. 90% of the time, you're not gonna have to worry about that. Okay, not gonna have to worry about it. The doctors will, <laughs> the doctors will. All right, what about this one? <sighs> oh, good it's alkalosis. How can my patient get there? More base. Too much base, too little acid. Both are too high. So it's the it's the base. So it's a metabolic alkalosis. Yeah. So again, both to compensate renal and respiratory esophagus and non renal failure. Correct. And we're not, we're not entertaining renal we're not doing that. So, um, now here's the next part. Okay. We're, we're going to start thinking about compensation if, and when both systems can compensate, which one do you think we do more of peeing or breathing? Jennifer said that, right? <laughs> breathing. Oh, you mean like which more do we do compensation? Because obviously we breathe more. But... We do breathe more. We we make about two milliliters per minute of urine. Mm -hmm. And we breathing, breathe. we have 15 breaths per minute at 500 milliliters per breath. Right. So a lot more breathing. There we go. So the idea is if you have both systems that can compensate, like for a metabolic disorder, which system is going to respond the quickest? Breathing. 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 Okay, good. Now let's talk about breathing compensation, okay? Because that's the easier of the two. What does breathing compensation look like? Let's start with that. Breathing compensation can look like this. You're either holding your breath or you froze. So <laughs> no, I was holding my breath. <laughs> breathing rate and depth. Right, so breathing rate can drop. That was me being dramatic, holding my breath. That's a breathing rate of zero. Uh -huh. <clears throat> breathing rate and depth. Breathing rate and depth can be short, shallow breaths that are few and in between. Did 
very much doesn't look like you. Few breathing, few breaths, short and shallow. Okay. Hardly any ventilation. There's hardly any air going all the way to the depths of the lungs mm -hmm. and back. Now, another way that breathing compensation looks like, <clears throat> do it with me. Um, <clears throat> I know you all aspire to be porn stars. So oh, yes. let's practice, shall we? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Breathing rate and depth. No, it, that, was not, that was not a beacon for you to come in. It was, all the Catholic it, it was all the Catholic you nuns. Very clearly, do it with me. I know. All the Catholic Wait. nuns. <laughs> so, <laughs> that increased rate and depth um, happens in metabolic acidosis. For example, metabolic acidosis is a real threat in uncontrolled diabetes mellitus. We knew that from unit two with all the beta hydroxybutyrate, acetoacetic acid building up, right? And so the person with uncontrolled diabetes mellitus with all that low pH and it's metabolic in origin, they're not processing fats well, they're not processing sugars well, they start doing this increased rate and depth of breathing and it's called cusmal breathing. Oh, that's weird. So that's from metabolic acidosis. Okay. So they literally have too much acid built up in them. So think about it. If you have too much acid, like CO2, the volatile one, uh -huh. increasing the rate and depth, I'm getting rid of it. You're getting rid of more of it. And that by getting rid of that CO2, you're helping to raise your pH back up. Okay. If you have metabolic alkalosis, reducing your rate and depth mm -hmm. means you're trapping CO2 mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. your body. And that means you will lower your pH back down. Right. Okay. Okay. Now, renal compensation is going to take us some time tonight we're having fun we're having more fun renal compensation not is fun. not fun it's <laughs> not fun um so i'm going to skip slide 17 and 18 for right now okay and just tell you that when your kidneys compensate you make different urine and a normal pH for urine is, it, it's a wide range. It's from as low as four to as high as eight. That's a very acidic urine and a pretty alkaline urine. <clears throat> and the kind of urine you make is different. So for example, in the morning, your urine is more acidic. Why? Because during the night when you've been sleeping, you haven't been eating you have been using alternative fuels like fats. And because you're not eating and you're trying to burn these fats, you start making more acetone, beta hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetic acid. Of those three, two are not vol volatile. They come out in the urine. That's beta hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetic acid. The acetone comes out in your breath, which is why in the morning your breath smells. Mm -hmm. You've got that sweet breath. So from now on, when you wake up in the morning and you've got that stinky breath, I want you to turn to your partner, your kids, whoever is nearby, your dog, your cat, and go, good morning. I've been burning fats all night. <laughs> That's why your breath is so stinky. The stinkier, the better. You've been burning more fat. Arguably, a reason to sleep more. <laughs> Burn more fat. <laughs> I mean, 
<laughs> and plus you're not eating as much unless you're on some of those sleep aids like Lunesta when people start sleepwalking and then making full meals and eating. Oh, <laughs> and it happens. They, yeah. they do. They make full meals, like Thanksgiving size meals, and they eat and they don't understand why they're gaining weight until their family members catch them in the act and videotape them. <laughs> so um, sleep more means you eat less and you burn through your fat. I mean, it's awesome. <laughs> what a great weight loss plan. And actually, studies actually do show that people who sleep well and have good sleep hygiene, and, and by good sleep hygiene, it means that they fall asleep within about five to 10 minutes of their head hitting the pillow. Too fast is not good, too slow is not good, and they stay asleep, tend to be skinnier people. <laughs> True. Okay, I must not sleep well. <laughs> True true story true story so um, we make we make different kinds of urine and it reflects compensation for acid base issues that our bodies are going through okay so let me just jump ahead a little bit um let me just jump ahead a little bit i'm i'm kind of hopscotching Acidosis. If our pH drops below that vital range, below roughly 7.1, it's going to cause excitable cells to not behave well. They cannot do their job. And when you have excitable cells like neurons not firing action potentials, then you're going to also have muscle weakness because remember a neuron has to target skeletal muscle. So with acidosis, you get fewer action potentials and then the person does not have good muscle tone. If this persists, it will lead to coma and death. Nice. What about alkalosis? With alkalosis, you actually get neurons that fire too much. Wow. And this can lead to increased motor tone, like muscle spasms and tetany. It also, alkalosis can lead to lightheadedness, um, numbness, which is weird. It still is a sign that the neurons <laughs> are are firing at a rate where then your brain interprets these sensations as discne um, that's not what I want to say, um, paresthesias, weird, weird feelings, like the numbness, tingling hands, and you're feeling lightheaded, like you're dizzy. It can still lead to coma and death. So if you want to, do you want to see Okay, we're gonna we're gonna turn into porn stars. You need to do this with me. Do you wanna do you want to experience how quickly, how quickly an acid-based disorder can set in? And the best demonstration of this is for me to show you how to have respiratory alkalosis. So start pretending that you're in a porn movie or you're you're inflating your favorite inflatable toy. Ethan, don't tell me what that is, okay? <laughs> don't oh, tell me. Ethan. <laughs> <laughs> I hope he's laughing. Cover your ears. Yeah, I am. <laughs> I feel like he's my son. <laughs> so if you if you if you do this, if you Start <clears throat> breathing very rapidly, exhaling a lot, it, like you're blowing up a balloon. You've all experienced where you've been inflating something and you, you get lightheaded, don't you? You get dizzy. Yes. It's that fast. It's that fast. 
Yeah. You, you are, when you do that, you're in respiratory alkalosis. I don't want to do that. That takes two seconds for me now, especially as I've gotten older. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So these, these acid base disorders in particular, when they're respiratory, they can have a very quick onset. And look, I'm here to tell you that if someone, if someone has a pH that is technically in normal range, let's say they're 7.36, okay? Technically in normal range, but they're on the low end of normal. I am telling you, they're not, they're not right in the head. Same thing on the other side, if they're in alkalosis, still normal range, but 7.44, let's say. Oh. They're not right. People with acid-base disorders, bottom line, they have central nervous system problems. Brain, mm. spinal cord, brain. We're talking centers in the brain that are now not behaving right. These people will not be logical. They will not be reasonable. You can't say, you can't just slap them and say, snap out of it. It's almost like they have a mental disorder at that point. You got to get that acid base issue back into a tighter range. Because even 7.35 or 7.45, technically normal not so good. Look, the pH scale is on a scale of 10. Right. It's the same kind of scale as our earthquake system. Mm -hmm. An earthquake of five versus six. Huge. Right? It is a big change. Mm -hmm. So going from 7.40 to 7.35 may not seem like a lot, but on that base 10 scale, it's a lot. It's a lot. Um, so keep that in mind. All right. In our last 10 minutes, what I want you to know on slide 21 are reasons why someone can have respiratory acidosis or respiratory alkalosis. On slide 22, I am showing you reasons why a person can have metabolic acidosis or metabolic alkalosis. These last three bullets here are important, but will take me some time to explain. It's gonna take me some time. Most of you are going to take advantage of this long weekend that we have since we're not meeting on Wednesday. I really recommend you finish all lectures dealing with renal system. You finish the filtration lecture, which you should have done by now. You should finish the reabsorption and secretion lecture. You should finish the electrolyte lecture and feel free to get on YouTube and watch the last part of this acid base lecture. It's the, the dots start getting connected. All four of those lectures, they, they are, they they're woven fabric. They go together. There's pieces of each lecture appearing in another lecture. So I, I will get there. I am going to finish with you acid base, but it's gonna be next week. And it's like a good book, isn't it? It's like a good book. You just, you don't wanna put it down. No. You're, gonna, you're gonna read through the night. <laughs> I know you're not. But if we look, if we look at our homework packet, let's just do some problems here on this page, page 10. You should have labeled up at the top for each of those four patients what their diagnosis is. Remember patient A was metabolic okay. alkalosis, right? Right. Mm -hmm. 
Patient B was metabolic acidosis. Patient C was respiratory acidosis. And patient D was respiratory alkalosis. Okay. Now, let's say you're looking at this homework packet and you say to yourself, oh, slide 21 and 22 go with this homework packet page. I can look up these, these prompts in my homework page with these two slides, and you can. But I think the fun is trying to reason through them without looking for the answers on slide 21 and slide 22, right? Slide 21 has patient C and D on here. Slide 22 has patients A and B on here, right? So let's just pick one. Let's pick number five. You have a patient that has overdosed on salicylic acid. Salicylic acid is aspirin. aspirin. And then, so you didn't know that salicylate was an acid until I said salicylic like acid. acid. Okay. It's an acid. So ping right there. Acidosis. Our patients is going to be an acidosis. And did they eat or drink something? Eat it. They did. So this is going to be metabolic acidosis. Here it is. No, eat or drink. <sighs> Okay, so what about number six? We have a patient who's peeing out their anus, as I like to say. <laughs> <laughs> and when you have raging diarrhea, what you are losing is a lot of bicarbonate buffer from your pancreas. Your pancreas makes a ton of bicarbonate rich buffer to neutralize stomach acids. So if you have diarrhea, you're losing everything in your intestinal tract, and that means the pancreatic buffers. There goes your base. If you're losing base, are you, and is this definitely a metabolic disorder, right? You definitely have some GI issues. That's all about metabolism. Yeah. You're losing your base. You have acidosis. Too much acid, yeah. Right, so you, you have too little base. That's metabolic acidosis. Metabolic acidosis. Okay, what about number seven? Number seven gets people. Severe. Well, it already tells you there. Oh, does it? Well, it tells you lactic acid. acid. That's true. But a lot of students say, well, Belinda, it also says hypoxia. <laughs> Low. And then, and then here's where the teacher steps in and says, what is the definition of hypoxia? Hypoxia means reduced oxygen content in a tissue bed. And if my tissue bed has reduced oxygen content, this does not mean my patient has a breathing problem. Hypoxia can result from, let's say, a blood clot blocking transport of blood to a tissue bed, and therefore it's not getting delivery of oxygen. It's not necessarily a breathing problem. So if a tissue bed is becoming hypoxic, then it can't participate in aerobic respiration. Then it would be participating in anaerobic metabolism. And that's where you get the lactic acid. Lactic acid is a byproduct of anaerobic metabolism. So this is metabolic acidosis. Mm -hmm. And then of course, we can look at number 12. 
hyperventilation syndrome, or as I like to say, porn <laughs> star wannabe. <laughs> respiratory. It would definitely be respiratory. Alcohol. And you're losing too much CO2. So there goes your acid. It'll be respiratory alkalosis. Now, when someone is hyperventilating, can we facilitate helping them? That's where having them breathe into a bag can help because now they're rebreathing the CO2. Oh, so that's the purpose of the bag? <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> all these years, all these years. Yeah. So just so we're clear, the, the, the bag should not be plastic, ideally. Right. And the bag does not, if it's plastic, sure as hell does not go over their head. <laughs> Unless you don't like them. Then maybe, <laughs> you know. <laughs> anyway, so from your homework packet, that's where you, these two slides, slide 21 and 22, is where you can check your answers. But it is more fun. I think <clears throat> when you're studying with each other to go through and explain why the explanation is key. Now, just let's take just two minutes. I know we're getting towards the end, but now let's turn to our lab manual and now let's practice with our calculator. Let's just practice one problem in our last few moments together. Okay. Won't take long, I promise. Is it on page 36? Well, or I was just going to say it won't take long, assuming you can find the page quickly. Um, I just had it and I lost my page. It is on page 38. 38. So acid base problems. Um, the intro actually starts on page 30, right? So if you, if you hate this lecture, if you don't want to listen to it again, if you're more of, hey, I can read through it and make sense of it, this entire lecture basically is written out in your lab manual. Oh. Basically. Um, in your lab manual, instead of millimeters of mercury, you might read TOR instead. So instead of millimeters of mercury for your CO2, you might read on occasion TOR. Oh, got it. You can interchange those. Right. Okay? Yeah. Okay, so let's do number one. Let's just do number one. We have a person who has had general malaise and is diagnosed as acidosis. The person is showing clinical signs of nervous system depression and unresponsiveness. Remember, that's what happens with acidosis. Um, but here are their lab values. They have a partial pressure of, for CO2 of 69 and bicarbonate of 39. Now, enter those values into your Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. Okay. Start, start crunching your numbers. And as you do that, let me caution you with a classic mistake. Some students look at the numbers and they play this game. Which of the values are more out of normal range? Like which one is more wronger? More wrong? Yeah. Which one's more wronger? <laughs> Don't do that. Do not yeah. do that. Don't do that. Because you are not remembering that there's a correction value of 0 0.03. Yeah. Okay. So go ahead and do your math calculations. And when you're ready, tell me what pH you get.
I got 7.38. I did too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I got. Okay, so look, you heard me say that you will have two acid base problems, all right? This slide I'm about to show you is not in the PowerPoint, but in the videos you hear me talking about these test questions over and over and over again. You will be asked to calculate pH. That'll be worth something like a point and a half. You will be, ex you will be asked to explain your, the patient's disorder and, and basically um, justify so that's, that's the second part. It says, using the method described in class, identify the specific acidosis condition. Explain your reasons, okay? Here's what here is a response that would get perfect points, worth two and a half points. And you're gonna hear this in the video too, okay? Oh, you can play it over and over again. And I make, I make fun of it. I say, here's what you write. Kara, comma, I calculated a pH of 7.38, which is below 7.40. Therefore, this patient has acidosis. A patient can have acidosis from too much acid or too little base. Normal values for the base, bicarbonate, are 22 to 26 millimolar. Normal values for the acid, CO2, are 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury. When I look at my patient's values, both the CO2 and the bicarbonate are elevated. A patient can have acidosis from too much acid but a patient can't have acidosis from too much base. Therefore, the acid is the problem and this patient has respiratory acidosis. Perfect. Okay, that's, that's the kind of justification I need. I need to read, I need to read that you say my patient has this, a patient can get this from too much this or too little this. Normal values for this are, normal values for this are, therefore my patient has specifically respiratory metabolic, you fill in the blanks, acidosis, alkalosis. I need to read all that. Okay. Will that, will that be the 10 points you're talking about? Or will no. there also be that that'll be like four points that you're talking about? So this the first <laughs> one would be like let's say 1.5. Okay. Okay. The second one would be let's say 2.5. Okay. One example how a person can develop the problem. One point. Just give me one flipping reason why a person can have respiratory acidosis. Okay. Don't show off. Don't, Don't give me a whole list of things because chances are- You make a mistake. Some, yeah, and it happens. And then you'll be like negative three. <laughs> one. Yeah. Okay. One. Yeah. Okay. And then, so um, would the person be helped or hindered? So in a clinical setting, if a patient has acidosis, we can give them bicarbonate. Okay. If the person has alkalosis, we can give them lactic acid in an IV. Gotcha. So that'll be another point, okay? And then down here, um, it'll be like three and a half points or something like that. Gotcha. And then what kind of urine will they make? Normal, acidic, Alkali, um, alkaline. Um, the kidneys will always be compensating. We're going to talk about that on another right. day. Right. You're not allowed to say, nope, my patient's in renal failure. No, no, no. <laughs> so yeah. don't mark, don't mark normal. It's not going to be normal. Okay. 
the P, the urine, will have the same pH issue as the body. Okay. If your patient's in acidosis, then the kidneys are going to get rid of more acid. Okay. If your patient's in alkalosis, then your patient's going to get rid of more base. Okay. Okay. So the urine will reflect the problem that the body has. Gotcha. Okay. So that if that's going to be how roughly your 10 points breaks down. Six. And we're going to do that two times on the left. Yeah. And okay. so here's, okay. So that's roughly the breakdown. Okay. It's 10 points. Nice. Now, sweeties, you're going to get one of each. Okay. Okay. If one of your problem is a respiratory, then the other one is going to be metabolic. And if one of your problems is acidosis, the other one's going to be alkalosis. Okay, so Sarah might have respiratory acidosis, metabolic alkalosis, and Nancy might have metabolic acidosis and respiratory alkalosis. Okay, but you're going to have one of each kind. And the compensation part, that's where you're telling me about breathing. Well, clearly if it's a respiratory problem, you're not going to, you're not going to be talking about respiratory compensation, are you? No, right. So then that means those entire three points come down to you describing correctly renal compensation. And, and you're writing a lot. So it's a paragraph. If you have a metabolic disorder, well, then you are telling me about respiratory compensation and renal. And again, the compensation story, we'll get there. Yeah. We, we will do problems together where we will go through all of these steps so you are clear as day, clear as day what to expect on your lab exam. It's right there. Yeah. I just gave away 20 points. And I'm also going to tell you how to respond. Yeah. The only thing I can't do for you is calculate the pH. And if you get that wrong, my sweets, there it goes the points. Yeah. And that's a sad day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see it happen every, every semester. There's at least one person it doesn't listen to me and they give me some value where the patient is dead. Why, why would I give you a dead patient to evaluate? That does not make sense. So we'll, we're going to end there. And here's my prescription until I see you next week. My prescription for you again is to finish all lectures for the renal system. My prescription for you would also be to finish this acid base video. I have done, I have done about 70% of it. <clears throat> what I haven't done is the renal compensation. What I haven't done is explain those <clears throat> last three bullets for metabolic um, uh, acidosis or alkalosis. Yeah, alkalosis, those last three bullets but they're in this PowerPoint. I will be doing all of that next week with you on Monday, but I recommend working ahead and I suspect your tutors would recommend that too. Um, <clears throat> next week, there will be some homework problems that we're also going to work on. So next week on Monday, we'll finish acid base and we'll do some homework problems. Um, also over the weekend, uh, I would I expect you to do your urine analysis labs. The urine analysis PowerPoint with video links is already under lab two. It is just like how we did our blood pressure CVP lab. You watch the videos and you pause it to collect your data. And then you answer the questions in your lab manual. Um, <clears throat> So if we were in lab together, you would all be peeing in cups.
coming back to lab and using urine dipsticks and you'd be analyzing your own urine. You'd be looking at your urine under a microscope. Um, some students don't wanna look at their urine under a microscope and they use the prepared slides, which in the videos we say, hey, go to this website and look at prepared slides. Um, I quite frankly hated when students wanted to look at their own urine under a microscope, not because it was, um, not because it was a hard technique and it's not something that I had to help them with too much. It's just, there have been some really bad circumstances when oh. that has happened. For example, uh -huh. I had, um, it's usually female and the female student says, Kara, can you come over here and look at my urine slide? Something's moving. <laughs> so then, so then everyone, of course, it's a loud laboratory. People are talking, having fun. Mm -hmm. with pee. And then when someone says, can you come look at my pee? Something's moving when I look at it under a microscope, the lab gets deathly quiet. <laughs> um, and everyone pretends that they're writing in their notebook, but really their ears are like this. <laughs> and they're trying to hear what I'm saying. And the conversation usually goes like this. <laughs> Sweetie, does it burn when you pee? <laughs> um, because though you've you've got does it hurt and I, yeah it has been i'm really prone to utis well yeah bingo you got another one you got one <laughs> do you have a doctor holy shit and then probably the the worst one was um inevitably when we would actually do urine analysis together it would be um right around lecture four exam. And because, because when I teach at nights face-to-face, -face, if it's not hybrid, we do lecture first and then lab. So if it's, if it's an exam, they take their exam first and then they come back to do lab. Well, this one female <clears throat> finished her exam very early left the room as most of the most students do to have a break. So she of course decides to look at her urine under the microscope and she says, Kara, will you come over here? There, you look at my urine, there's something moving. Oh man. <laughs> so here I go thinking, okay, I'll be discreet. And I look at it. And I say something like, well, <laughs> what did we do on the break? And she says, what do you mean? I said, well, it looks to me like you had some fun. And she got all red and <laughs> basically she yes. said, she, well, her boyfriend met her in the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> but how is she having you even look at it why wouldn't she think about that holy shit i would have not peed in that cup <laughs> Be, well because my sweets clearly it's a different hole i know but it's still just like it all comes out doesn't it I, and like, you just even be thinking i would just you know i wouldn't have dropped my pants after that kind of stuff what the heck <laughs> oh <laughs> so what do you what do you say to, what how what do you do and and my what I wanted to do you. I know I did I was like high five <laughs> <laughs> I did after that test <laughs> anyway those are the reasons why I don't like it when students actually say I want to look at my urine under a microscope yeah. and I say then keep it to yourself Please. Better than burning after when you pee. I mean, <laughs> oh, God. it's fun. Um, 
So that's my prescription. Finish renal. <sighs> Go through your homework packet for renal. We're going to work on some things together, but if you work ahead and you have we problems, have we're go I'm going to catch up with you. We're going to finish acid base and then do your urine analysis lab. And don't forget to send me your PhysioX number nine and watch the review of PhysioX number nine. Do we have to do the acid base balance one, the physio? Not yet, because okay. I haven't covered renal compensation. And okay. um, I want you to be able to look at your data from that Physio X and really understand what you're seeing. Okay. Okay. Do we send you the urinalysis one or that we're going to just work together? No, that one, that's where you fill in your lab manual and you don't uh -huh. see your lab manual until the day of your lab exam. Okay, got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so, my sweethearts, if you don't have any questions, 